excited to see all of you here this morning and get uh, worshiping together once again inside the building. Crazy. standing for the first time in a while for our next song. That, that first song comes from Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse 6. It says, For us to a child, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is uh, our God. He is the one who um, was predicted to come, prophesied to come, and he came, uh, and now we are here, are, are here today to worship him, and we fall down at, at Jesus' feet. Sing that. Here we go. Thank you. 
Holiness, God is holy, uh, and that's why we cry, holy, 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 to the Lord God Almighty.
service where we take communion and remember Jesus and his sacrifice. Uh, so you can turn over to Romans uh, chapter 5. We'll be looking at that this morning. So tonight, I'm glad we sing songs first. We worship in that way first. So just help get in the right mindset. Now that we're back to coming to church, there's lots of different things that can happen in the morning. Uh, you can kind of refresh, get the mindset after the crazy car rides or the delays that were unexpected. Now that we're coming back in person. But it is good to be back. It's good to have to put pants back on again for the service. So. Anyway, Romans chapter 5 we're going to be looking at. This whole pandemic has been quite interesting. Uh, just seeing people's responses, uh, seeing what's important, what people's priorities are. Uh, it's been across the world. And it's just been a huge thing that I don't think we've seen in our lifetimes before. Um, there's been a lot of death. There's been a lot of suffering. But one of the main things that COVID-19 caused was separation. You know, <clears throat> as we come back today, that's what we appreciate. We appreciate seeing one another in person. Yes, we've been doing this outside for a little bit, but it's nice to be back in the building and to be able to see each other. So throughout this time, there's been some death, there's been some suffering, and there's been separation. And it's hard not to think about that in the midst of thinking of communion, how that is what sin does with us and God. It causes death and suffering and separation. Separation between us and God. And there's been a lot of talk lately about a uh, possible vaccine and different studies that are being pushed and everything. I know we've all heard a ton about it. But what is the cure for sin? What is to stop all the death and suffering that is caused by sin and the separation that we have? And for the believers, that's Christ. In Romans 5, we're going to start in verse 12. Talking about attaining peace with God. Is therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. So it's saying here, one, one man sinned, and sin entered the world. And I'm reminded of a silly fact that we uh, come to think of the, at the start of this whole pandemic, was you know, through one bat disease virus entered into the human world, and then everybody got disease. And if we jump down here to 18, it says, therefore, as to one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous acts, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded more. There's much more. In 21, it says, So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness, through eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So saying, we were separated, but Jesus is superior. His righteousness is attainable through Jesus Christ and eternal life through that. And there's been a lot of fear, and, and rightly so, throughout this whole pandemic. But in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus was discussing with his disciples and uh, telling them what to do. And <clears throat> I'm going to turn quickly into Matthew 20, 10 28. been a lot of fear throughout this whole thing with the loss of life. But in Matthew 10 and 
In 28, Jesus tells his disciples, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So as you're thinking on communion this morning and reflecting, what have your priorities been? Have you been afraid of dying and losing your physical body? Or have you been looking into the Word and making sure that you're not going to lose your soul? So, for the thought for communion, I'm going to read Romans 5 and end here with verses 8. It says, But God demonstrates, demonstrates His own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. So there is sin, there is death and suffering, but Jesus is it clear. Jesus is our hope and our salvation. Through Him, we can have reconciliation and be with God and have eternal life. So we're going to do like we, we did outside. We'll have three um, tables here set up. Uh, two, one over there, and then two in the back. I'm going to grab gloves, and I'll have pass that out. So let's go ahead and think on these things. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and for his sacrifice uh, that we might attain righteousness through him and through his life and death and resurrection. I thank you for the hope that we can have in the midst of death and suffering and sin and separation from you and that we can be reconciled. <clears throat> thank you for showing your love towards us even while we're still in sin and sending Jesus and Help us to live lives that are uh, just striving to live the way that Jesus did and uh, that we can accept and sacrifice. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
purpose and that we don't have to be afraid of what destroys the body because you have saved our souls. And thank you for that hope. I just pray that as we continue our service today and that you'll be uh, blessing those that are here and uh, blessing the tithes and offerings today as well. Do these things in Jesus' name. To, uh, good to see everybody. Um, I think I'm a little loud. It'll be Maine and then well, After months and months, we're back in the building and able to kind of show off the uh, renovations. That's kind of exciting. But a couple of announcements before we uh, get into the message. Um, and I forgot totally just blanked it and didn't make a PowerPoint, so I don't have any PowerPoint for announcements or for uh, the sermon. So you do have a handout, but um, you don't have any slides to follow along, so you'll have to listen. But um, <clears throat> Next week will be indoors, like today. Um, you'll need to register, and um, things will hopefully <laughs> be very similar and flow um, like, like today, um, there may be a little tweak here and there as we learn how to do this new um, way of, of gathering, but thank you for your cooperation and your patience with us as we, we try to, to figure this out. Next week, uh, next Sunday, will be our business meeting. That will be via Zoom. That will be at 2 o'clock, and so... Uh, when we send the email out with the Zoom links for Sunday School, we'll include the link for um, the business meeting next Sunday. Um, Sunday School continues online on Zoom, um, so those will be at 4 o'clock. So, again, those should be in your email. Save the date for Vacation Bible School, September 16th through the 20th. There will be more information coming out uh, quickly. Happy birthdays this week. We have three. Mike, Caleb, and Quinley are all celebrating birthdays this week. So happy birthday to those three. And if you see them, give, uh, give them a rousing well wishes for their birthday. As I'm looking at the list, Quinley's probably the most excited about having a birthday. The other two are probably over birthdays, but um, that's just the way it goes. And happy anniversaries. We actually don't have an anniversary this week, but I forgot one for last week. Um, Eddie and Chrissy um, had a anniversary last week, and I forgot to mention them. So happy anniversary to them. Family of the week this week is Danny and Sue Tripp. So pray for them and talk to them, see if there's anything specifically that um, they need prayer for this week. So family of the week, Danny and Sue. All right, so we're going to try something a little bit different this week. So John's going to come here in a second. We're going to move this over. But while we're doing that, parents, if you could make sure your kids have masks on and have them come up. I'm going to have them sit right here. I'm going to move this out of the way. And uh, we're going to do something just a little bit different. So all of the young ones, come right up here and have your masks on and sit down on the stage, kind of crisscross applesauce. All right. Coming, Cole. Winley. All right. So, what we wanted to do is because you guys haven't been able to be together in class, 
now we're coming back to church, to the building, and um, your class is still going to be online, but I wanted to make every sermon that we do on Sunday morning have a little bit of something just for you guys, okay? So they're going to be able to listen in, but this is really, this is for you, okay? You guys excited? You guys all awake? Okay. So, as you can see here, let me move some of this out of the way, we have some supplies here. And raise your hand and tell me if you, can, if you guys know, does everybody know what all three of these are? Raise your hand if you know what all three of them are. Okay. Alora, well, you're not sure what all three of them are? Okay. Let's see if we can get some help. Levi, what's this one? Toilet brush. That's absolutely correct. Um, Quinley, do you know what this one is? Hair brush. That's right. Does anybody know what this one is? Lila. Toothbrush. Okay, so we've got a toilet brush, a hair brush, and a toothbrush. So these are all brushes, and they're used to help us in cleaning, right? So has anybody ever used one of these? You have? Okay, well, wow, you're ahead of me because I don't think I used it at your age. So, if you were to look for these, you're going to look for these for something specific. These help us to do a job, which is cleaning and, and taking care of things. But if I was to say, Quinley, go brush your teeth, would you choose this one? Would you pick this up to go brush your teeth? Now, there are some people that... Never mind, we're not going to go there. Um, all right, so no, you're not going to do this. Aiden, if I say go brush your hair, would you choose this one? I mean, you could, right? You could, you could brush, but no, it's, that's, not, that's not... They have specific functions and specific purposes, and that's what we use them for. Second Timothy chapter 2 says that the Lord wants to use you for special purposes, so make yourself clean from all evil, and then you will be holy, and the Master can use you. You will be ready for any good work. And so this verse says that God wants to use you for special tasks. So just like these are for specific things, this is for brushing our teeth, right? This is for cleaning the toilet. We're not going to mix those things up. Now, I'll tell you, you want to hear a gross story? So when I was your age, I didn't understand germs, and I didn't understand specific purposes. And so, have you ever been in a bathroom where the sink and the faucet had spots on it and it was kind of, it kind of needed some cleaning. Have you ever seen something like that? Well, my brothers and I, we would all go, I have four brothers, and we would go in and brush our teeth together. We had to all go at the same time. Mom and dad would say, go brush your teeth, and whoom, all of us would go into the bathroom at the same time. Well, we would see the faucet was dirty, and we would get done brushing our teeth, and they had a toothbrush, and the faucet needed cleaning, so we would use our toothbrush after we brushed our teeth, and we would clean the faucet. Isn't that gross? I think about it now, and I cringe, right? But then we would just rinse it off, put it in the stand, and guess what happened the next night? We used the toothbrush again. So, it's kind of gross, but that was something that I did. And so... If we, if we want to clean our hearts, so this verse says that we need to make ourselves clean from evil. Do you think that reading a book about Bob the Tomato would help us to understand how to make our, our heart clean? Maybe a little bit, but probably not, okay? What about if we would read a book like Harry Potter? Is that going to help us know how to be clean? No, that's not going to help us. We need to read... The Bible, right? The, the, the Bible has a specific purpose, and it's to help us to know about God. And so, 
How many of you have ever been to the dentist? Okay, it's not the funnest experience in the world, but it's one that's really important, right? And so if you go to the dentist, the dentist is going to tell you to do what? Brush your teeth, right? And so we have in our lives, we have this dirty stuff called sin. And in Psalm 51, in verse number 2, it says, this is the easy to read version, it says, scrub away my guilt, wash me clean from my sin. And so the Bible talks to us about cleaning our lives from sin. So, John tells us in 1 John 1 and verse 7 that we should live in the light where God is, and if we live in the light and have fellowship with Him, the blood sacrifice of Jesus, God's Son, washes away every sin and makes us clean. So, I want to show you guys So we're going to draw, and I am a horrible artist, so don't judge me. You guys can probably do this better than me. Can anybody tell me what that is? Whoa! So I did good on that one. All right, so we have a heart, right? And so we're going to act like this is your heart, okay? And so... Is there anything in that heart? Is that Would you say that heart is clean, or would you say that heart is dirty? It's clean, right? So, the Bible talks about us needing to be scrubbed clean from sin. So, would you say that sin makes us dirty? Yes. Makes our heart dirty? Yes. And then the blood of Jesus needs to come and wash that sin away, right? Yes. So... A sin would be like um, fighting with our brother or sister, right? Yeah. Um, if, we, if we're angry and we treat them with, with a rotten attitude, that's not really something that we should do, right? Has anybody ever done that? Okay. I've done that. So let's say this is going to be fighting with our brother or sister. So is this heart clean anymore? No. No, it's got dirty stuff in there, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, what about if we disobey our parents? Is that, do you think that's a sin? Yeah. Okay. Has anybody ever done that? Yeah, I've done that. So, here's, here's some more. This is, we're going to call this disobeying our parents. All right, so is that heart a little bit dirtier? Yeah, it is. So, we've got things that we do that is against what God says. God tells us to honor our parents. God tells us to love each other. And so we do these things, and it gets our heart all dirty. And the Bible says that we need to scrub our life clean, and that the blood of Jesus is what washes our sins away. Now, this is a dirty heart, right? Now watch this. Because this is going to kind of represent what happens with the blood of Jesus. So, you guys can come stand up here and watch. So, we're going to pour some water in here, and this is going to represent the blood of Jesus. Now, do you think we can clean this heart up? All right, let's see if it works. It worked whenever I was practicing. Let's see if it works this time. So, it says we need to scrub it clean, right? So, we scrub our heart clean. And then, let's see what happens. Oh. So let's look here. Do we have a clean heart? Yeah. We do, don't we? So, that's kind of cool. That's the, what the Bible says the blood of Jesus does to our heart. So, we need to make sure we study and make sure that we understand God's Word. Because what we're going to be talking about today is God is holy. He doesn't have anything dirty in His heart, and He wants to make our hearts clean. All right? So you guys can go sit down. Thank you for coming. All right.
All right. We need a camera for close up on something like that, but. Each week, um, I want to do something just for the just for the kids, kind of try to do something on their level, and hopefully give them something to look forward to um, every week. And um, especially in this time where we don't have classes for them in person, um, so hopefully that will be something that will stick with them. The last few weeks, we've been talking about God's character, attributes of God, and. Um, today, I want to focus us on the holiness of God. God is holy. When you think about the word holiness, holiness is pretty much a church word. You're not going to hear that word outside of church, right? <clears throat> what is it that you think about when you think about holiness? What, what kind of pops into your mind? When you think about holiness, does anybody have anything that just immediately you think holy and it jumps into your mind? Okay, isn't that, isn't that interesting? Because um, it, it, it's an interesting concept that we hear in church, but it's kind of only here. And so it, it's something that's a little bit um, maybe different and hard to understand. And so hopefully by the end of today, we'll have a little bit better grip and we can think about it a little bit more. Because holiness is the foundation to the being of God. We have, we have talked about God's power. We have talked about God's knowledge. But all of those things, all, all of those things are important. I'm not saying that they're not important. But kind of what ties all of them together is God's holiness. And so... Here's a basic definition of God's holiness. God is separated from sin and devoted to seeking honor. And so, um, in your fill-in-the-blank form, there are three meanings for holiness that we want to talk about this morning. Number one is to be set apart. So, holiness means to be set apart. It is... Something that um, is a comparison to something else. It doesn't mean to be um, set apart in a weird way. It just means to be distinct from something. And many times in Scripture, we will see this word holy used to describe places where God was present. For example, the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle, the um, if you think back to Moses when he encountered the bush that wouldn't burn up, said, step away because the place you're standing is what? Holy. And so, um, it, 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 a definition of holiness is to be set apart. Now, the second one is to be perfect or spiritually pure, causing adoration and reverence. To be perfect or spiritually pure, causing adoration and reverence. There's a country song called Holy, H period, O period, L period, Y period. And it stands for high on loving you, and it says that he's writing the song to a girl, says, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. What's he doing? He's adoring her. He is like, um, I don't know. Stop sort of saying he's worshiping her, but he's infatuated, right, with with her. And so he says, you're holy. Um, the psalmist declares several times in Psalms 99 that God is holy, and he concludes the chapter, Psalms 99, by saying, Praise the Lord our God, bow down toward his holy mountain, and worship him. The Lord our God is holy. And so... We worship God, and part of why we worship God is because He's holy, because He is set apart, because He is perfect, because He is spiritually pure. And so that causes us to adore Him and to 
um, have a reverence for him. The second one um, is, is similar but a little bit different. It still involves reverence, but the third one is to be in awe while being frightened beyond belief. And so we're in awe of God. We're, we see His splendor. We see His righteousness. We see His purity. But then because of our unrighteousness, because of our impurity, when we see that, we're scared of God. We're frightened. And you see this a lot throughout Scripture. When people have an encounter with God, they're scared. And they, and they shrink back. Isaiah chapter 6 is an example of that. When um, Isaiah sees the presence of God and he sees these angels and they're saying, holy, 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 he says, whoa, woe is me. I'm an unclean man and I'm an um, unclean man from a group of unclean clean people. And I... And, and he, was, he, was, he was frightened. So, what are some practical implications of God being holy? What are some practical implications of God being spiritually pure? Of God being um, somebody to, to be in awe of? Of God being set apart? God being different from the world and every other God? Well, God is absolutely pure. God is free from sin. God is free from evil. God is free from mistakes. And so that's why we can place our confidence wholly in Him and in His plan for salvation because only a sinless sacrifice could take away the sins of the people. In, a, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 4, it says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And so we, we see throughout the Old Testament the system that God had put up for um, washing, or for, um, would one really washing their sins away, for atoning for their sins. But it was an imperfect system. And so the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take the sins away of the people. And so without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, Hebrews tells us. And so that was why a perfect sacrifice needed to come, which was Jesus. And Jesus is not only perfect, but everything about Him is consistent. He never makes a mistake. It's not within His nature to lie. We looked about that as far as Him telling the truth and understanding the truth. The way that He deals with the world and the way that He deals with you and I is perfect. And that's... I, I think... I'm going to talk about this here, a little bit here in a minute, but I think one of the reasons that we struggle with God's holiness and the re, one of the reasons we struggle understanding God's holiness is because we are not consistent. We have to try to be consistent. And even then we fail. Right? We can't be truthful 100% of the time. All of us have lied. All of us have been dishonest. Now, hopefully we, we mature and we grow out of some of that where, um, you know, these, these little ones, it's amazing how early they learn how to do that, right? Um, but that's, that's a somewhat a sign of maturity is the fact that we can tell the truth and that we can be honest, right? But God's not even capable of lying. And it's really hard for us to grasp that. It's really hard for us to, to get a hold of that. His desires for you and I are perfect. Again, we have to work on that. Um, depending upon your nature, some people are, are different about this than others, but depending upon your nature, you, you want things that are good for people. You're, you're happy for people when, uh, when good things happen to them. But there's also, there's a part of you, you know, when, when somebody gets a new truck or somebody gets a new house or somebody gets a new job or somebody, you know, whatever. Um, there's, there's a part of us, if we're honest with ourselves, there's a little twinge of, of jealousy. There's a little twinge of, man, I wish I had a new truck. And I wish I had a new house. And I wish... But that's not the case with God. Psalm 77 and verse 13, David says, Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? That's one of those 
questions where there's an obvious answer. There is no God like our God. In Romans chapter 2, Paul compares God to us. Paul talks about impartiality and he talks about our uh, inability to be partial. And we can try really hard, but nothing compares to God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 2 and let's look at this because this is an interesting um, comparison here in Romans chapter 2. We're going to start in verse number 1. And. In the bigger context here, Paul is dealing with the old law and the new law and the, the Romans and the Gentiles and, and um, the fact that um, there was an imperfect system and Jesus had to come to perfect that system and that anyone who would want to, to be a part of the new covenant could. But there were some, some challenges. And so look here in verse number one. He says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Now, we don't ever see anything like that today, do we? We don't ever see a group of people or an individual or those maybe in power that would tell us to do something, but then not want to do it themselves? Or do we? Yeah, we're familiar with that. This is, this is something that is a, it's in the fabric of human nature for us to be this way. That's part of what Paul's pointing out. Look at verse 2. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet you do them yourself, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and infinite heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his work, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also for the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also for the Greek. Look at verse 11. For God shows no partiality. So, yes, God is kind. Yes, God is gentle. Yes, God is patient. Yes, God is loving. God is all of those things. But, God is also holy. And it's God's holiness that sets Him apart. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15 says, Which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one can, has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. See, God is not what American culture perceives him to be. He's not a grandfatherly looking man with a robe on waiting to just shoot lightning bolts at people. I think we struggle with understanding God's holiness. And I think we struggle because the, God's holiness is the hardest one for us to grasp. So you think about God loving. We, we have examples of God loving. I think if you have a father who has not treated you the best, then you struggle more to understand God's love. But if you have a father who's very loving, who's very nurturing, understanding the love of God is not a difficult stretch. 
It's not something that's hard. Because we've experienced that. We've seen that. When we see somebody, when we experience somebody loving, it's, it's easier for us to understand the love of God. Even from our moms. We, we, we get um, the, the love of a, of a mother. So we can somewhat get loving. God is, is a forgiving God. Well, we've experienced, most of us have experienced forgiveness. And so we're okay with, with kind of, maybe not to the level that God forgives. I mean, as far as the East is from the West and He remembers our sins no more and that kind of stuff, we, we, maybe not to that point, but just the concept of forgiveness, we get the concept of forgiveness. Because we've probably experienced a little bit about that. We talked about power, God's power. And we may not understand how powerful God is. We may not understand how big He is. But His power and, his, and our ability to understand, I mean, maybe not in real life, but we've seen cartoons, right? And so we've seen how the power of God can work, or how power can work within cartoons, so we can grasp that a little bit. The whole idea of God being everywhere, that may blow our minds a little bit, but we can grasp it a little bit. But again, because we have an imagination... But holiness, not having any sin, not being inconsistent, not wanting our own agenda, but only being focused on what's right, that is something that we don't see very often. That's not something that we can experience very often because it's contrary to human nature. Our human nature is to be selfish. Our human nature is to promote our own agenda. We have to work. And so we even have a term. Um, that judge is an unbiased judge. Why? Because most judges have a bias. And we understand that. And so there has to be a distinction drawn between that. So God's holiness and the reality of God's holiness should lead us to respond in worship and reverence. The holiness of God should have a profound effect on us. Our problem many times is that we have a knowledge that God is holy. We know God is holy, but our lives reflect a people that don't care. If you look at our actions, it you, the, the conclusion could be drawn that we don't care about the holiness of God. Just quickly as we close, let's be reminded of how the holiness of God influenced those who encountered it. We mentioned already Exodus 3 where um, Moses encounters this bush that won't burn up. And God said, take your sandals off because the place that you're standing is holy. In Exodus 3 and verse 6, it says, At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. In Revelation 4, the Apostle John gives us a sneak peek at what goes on around the throne of God. There was angelic beings um, surrounding him, bowing down before him, and day and night declaring that God is holy. We mentioned already Isaiah 6 where um, Isaiah comes into the presence of God and the angelic beings, the seraphim, are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. In Revelation 4 and verse 8, this is what it says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now you might recognize those words from a song that we sang last week called Revelation Song. And that's where this, the idea for that song, the words for that song came from.
It's not very often that you see the same word repeated like holy, holy, holy within Scripture. Within Hebrew culture, that was kind of like if, if, they would have, if it would have been a print and they would have had a highlighter, they would have been highlighting and bolding that. It was for emphasis. And so, again, you don't find it very often. Have you ever struggled to find the right word for, to, to describe something? So, maybe, like the first time I saw the Grand Canyon in person, it's like it takes your breath away. Or maybe, you know, maybe it was um, a car. I don't know what your, what your appeal is. Maybe it was a girl or it was a boy. You look at them and you're like, well, I've never seen a girl that beautiful before. And you're struggling to try to, to come up with the words, the adjectives. Or, or maybe it was a smell. Maybe it was awful. It was just... You're, you're, you're trying to relive this experience. Um, I, get, I told you a few of the story of um, we went camping and our camper, after about two days of being home, was just absolutely, it was awful. And it was so bad that coming up the driveway, you could smell it. I mean, it was just, it was, it was nasty. And so, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but I thought that my black tank was not draining properly, and so waste was in there and just baking in the sun. It ended up being... Somebody had, it, it was um, meat of some kind, and I don't even know exactly what kind of meat, that somebody had put into the bag and then tied the bag up and threw into the trash bag. And so how we missed it was when, they, when that happened, it looked like the bottom of the bag. It wasn't very much, and so it was down in the trash can, so we didn't empty the bag. And so we're cleaning and scrubbing and trying to figure this whole camper, and we just happened to, anyway, it was awful. So that smell when you're trying to describe and you're like, it was, you're looking for that word, right? So if somebody was describing, and they said the stone was big, you're, you're probably going to have an idea of a eh, fairly big stone. But if they say that stone was big, big, now the image that you have of the stone is going to get bigger, right? If they say the stone was big, 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 now you're thinking like ginormous, big stone, right? Sometimes it's hard to put into words what we want to accurately describe something. How would you describe God? Awesome God? Loving God? Merciful, gracious, just? Let me make it harder on us. If you had to use one word to describe God, what word would you use? To my, to my knowledge, and as far as I can tell, there's only two places where you see God described and the word repeated three times. Once in Isaiah 6, and once in Revelation 4, and both times it describes him as holy, holy, holy. I don't recall God being described as wise, 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 or powerful, 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 or God is love, love, love. But we do see God described as holy, holy, holy. When we look at the holiness of God, how do we respond? How do you respond? How do 
I respond to God's holiness. I pray that we will respond like Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6 when he said, Woe is me. I'm an unclean man. Because when we come face to face with the holiness of God, when we understand the holiness of God, we understand all that He is, it's going to reveal our flaws. It's going to reveal our weaknesses. It's going to reveal our shortcomings. And just like with the kids, I know you guys didn't see it all, but our hearts get dirty by sin. And Peter tells us that we are to be holy as He is holy. And on our own, that's just not possible. We have to have the blood of Jesus to wash our sins away. And so I hope that we respond like Isaiah when we say, woe is me. But I also, if you continue reading down to about verse 6, God says, who is going to go? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. I may be broken. I may, as I come face to face with the, with the holiness of God, I may re- realize how weak I really am. But God, if you are going to use me, if you are going to work through me, I will, I will go. That may mean that you're going to go to the mission field. That may mean that you're going to go be a preacher. But that also may mean that you're going to go to school and be an example. That may mean that you're going to go to work and love on your coworkers. That may mean that you're going to go home and be a good example to your kids or to your wife or to your husband. That may mean that you're going to go to that person who you've wronged and ask them for forgiveness and start to try to to restore that relationship. That may mean that you're going to go because God is holy. And God wants us to be holy as He is holy. So when you come face to face with God's holiness, how do I respond? How do you respond? Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word that helps us to understand and to see your attributes and your character clearly. God, I know that we we struggle to understand your holiness. God, help us to Help our understanding to grasp who you are. Help our response to be one that we run to you and not away from you. That we realize that because of your holiness that you have the ability to cleanse us. That only a sacrifice that was perfect was able to truly take away sin. Help us to realize how dirty our hearts really are and how much we need the blood of Jesus applied. Be with us as we go from here. We pray these things in Jesus' name.